Welcome back to the GCC Reseller Business School podcast. My name is Isa. I am a designer reseller, a business consultant, a builder of brands, mother of Chanelia, and this is my new venture. In today's episode, I will walk you through how it all started, how I got into resale, how the global collective came to be, and the difficult but amazing life lessons I learned on my way here that helped me build this all out. Warning. I'm going to ask you to do some deep digging at the end into your own challenging times, but I need you to trust me on this one. You might be pleasantly surprised with the outcome. So in order to start, I need to take you back, way back in time, circa the early 2000s to really explain to you how I was able to build the GCC into what it is today. I think my fascination with designers started when I was about 17. I come from a long line of very fashionable women who literally dress up to even go to the corner store. My grandma used to say, you should always be dressed up. You never know if you're going to meet your husband around the corner. Sorry to disappoint grandma. I'm 38, unmarried. I met Marco online and the first time I saw him, I was wearing jeans and sneakers. And I often leave the house looking like Encino man and the girl from the ring had a baby. It hasn't really affected me thus far, so I win. So I told you in the last episode, my life has been one big constant rebellion of what should be and what I am, and I am quite proud of that, but I digress. I have always been around very stylish women. You should see my grandma, my mom, my aunts, my cousins. They look like they stepped out of a fashion blog. My friends growing up were pretty wealthy, so their moms had a great lot of designer goods. I got to go into their fabulous and massive walk-in closets and scope out the goods. It was wonderful. Now, my first encounter with actually handling designer items was when I started working at Nordstrom. I actually worked in the older lady department at first, which was amazing because they're so easy to help, contrary to popular belief. They just buy multiples of their favorite item in several colors, throw down cash, and they're out. I used to think this was really strange. Like, why do these old women buy seven of the same item in the whole colorway? Now I get it. I'm one of those women. So most of them didn't even try the stuff on. So I didn't have to work that hard. I would spend my downtime wandering around the designer shoes and handbags. I would pick up every single brand, touch it, look at all the details, try them on, check the fit, and just walk around the sales floor to see what they felt like. I did the same exact thing when I worked at Bloomingdale's later on. This time I worked at the dresses right next to the furs. So on my free time, I'd go snoop around the designer goods and then try on $25,000 fur coats for fun. I think I made like maybe $18 an hour at that time. So one of those coats represented 1,388 hours of work for me. It was kind of a trip if I really thought about it. So for those of you that tell me that you didn't grow up around luxury and that's why you can't do designer flips or that you grew up poor or that you're not the most fashionable, blah, blah, blah. This is the absolute best way to learn designer. It's fun and it's free. So no excuses. Go touch some Fendi people. That's how you learn. The point is, I was always fascinated by the beauty of designer goods, the amazing materials, the craftsmanship, the way you felt when you wore certain items. And I'm not talking about logos just so people know you're rich. I'm talking about the way real silk feels on your body or the way you feel when you walk around in a pair of Louboutins, how nice your legs look in them, the beautiful intricate beading of a couture dress. I had to sneak to Neiman Marcus for that on my breaks, but we'll discuss that later. So I could not afford a single damn thing in these stores, but I watched shoppers and it was the best school of life I could have asked for for the GCC. I observed their behavior. I paid attention, and honestly, I was a pretty good salesperson, so that helped. I learned a lot during those years in retail, especially at those department stores. Now, they were hard. I was dealing with the family issues that I discussed in episode two, the downfall of it all, 
dealing with the trauma of everything that happened, mourning a life that I could have had but never got to fully experience, and my friends were a constant reminder of what could have been but wasn't. It was hard being the only one that had to work a full-time job during high school to pay for her own necessities. It was hard to drive my mom's old beat up red superstar or Astro star or whatever the heck those big vans were called back then. While my friends got brand new Mercedes. And here's the thing. I'm lucky to have had that van, right? I understand that that's privilege, but it's it's still hard to see, I guess, the duality of what was happening. Like I was living in these two worlds simultaneously. So that was kind of the weird part. Anyway, I moved out when I was 18. And even though I laugh about some of the situations now, like eating canned corn for a few days when things got real dicey with my money management, they kind of sucked. I remember when I was still going to school, before I dropped out because I decided that eternal debt wasn't for me, I would wake up at 7.30 a.m., get to school at 8.30 a.m. Then I'd be in class until about 12.30 p.m., run like Forrest Gump to the car, drive to work, change, and do my makeup in the bathroom in about half a second because my shift at Nordstrom started at 1. Get off of work at 10 because they close at 9, but then it's an hour of putting away other people's shit and then closing down shop. I get home at like 10.30, eat really fast, and do homework until about 1 a.m. Then I go to sleep and start it all over again. Honestly, it was horrible. But now I know why I had to go through all of that. Life was preparing me for right now. Life knew I needed to go through that to be able to build the global collective into what I know it can be. So I get it now. I really do. I remember sitting in my car during my hour-long lunch break at Bloomingdale's, promising that I would get out of the rat race, that this was only temporary, and that someday I would escape the cycle. And well, spoiler alert, I sure kept that promise to myself. So that's the first part, the earlier years of building the experience in designer, sales, and well, my character. Now we're going to go fast forward all the way to 2017. I was working at a big beer company in retail sales and account management. There's a freaking killer story about how I got the job and a pretty crazy thing I said during my interview to the VP of sales that I'm pretty sure sealed the deal on hiring me. But that's for another time. I'll get back to that one. So I was content at that job for a long time. I made really decent money. I had a crazy flexible schedule. They paid for my car, my gasoline. I pretty much ate for free at accounts every day and I had a corporate card. I was sitting pretty and I had a lot of time to kill in between meetings and on slow days. So I started going to the buy sell trade stores in LA because they were close to some of my accounts. So I had been to these kind of stores a handful of times before, specifically one called flashbacks in San Diego. And I'd bought a couple of things for myself in the past, but I was not brought up thrifting or buying secondhand. This might upset a lot of people. But I kind of like shaking the tree, so let's go there. Wearing used clothing was frowned upon in certain cultures. It's only now changing a bit. But in Mexico, especially in the society I grew up in, you didn't go around telling people you were wearing old clothes. Parents would go in debt and spend money they didn't have in order for the family to look a certain way. If you ever did wear hand-me-downs or buy secondhand, you certainly didn't tell the whole world about it. It was a pride thing for the family to show they could buy you new items and that they were moving up. I know. Trust me. It's strange, especially now the more I think about it. But that's where I came from. Thrifting or buying secondhand just wasn't something I grew up with. So aside from those couple of visits to flashbacks, that's all I knew about secondhand fashion. Unless it came from someone we knew, like a cousin, an aunt, you know, that's different. But it just wasn't a thing. So now, I was also a young idiot who knew nothing about money management, remember? I had serious money traumas, so I just thought my retail discount was a great deal and threw away all my hard-earned money there. Instead of, oh, 
I don't know, saving for the goddamn future or buying food? Like those days when I told you I'm buying canned corn for dinner, remember? Just imagine I'm wearing a bedazzled Rockin' Republic jeans set, maybe a Von Dutch bag with zero dollars in it while I'm buying the corn. But you live, you learn. Anyway, back to 2017. Guys, if I, if I keep going on these tangents, this episode's going to be 17 days long. I got to focus. Okay, okay. Let's go back to the secondhand stores during the slow days as a beer sales rep. Got it. So the first time I walked in, it was the Buffalo Exchange on La Brea. If you're from LA, you know what I'm talking about. It was a little overwhelming, racks and racks full of items. It smelled a little bit like grandma's closet. Not mine, but you know what I mean. And I felt a little lost because I didn't know where to start or why I was even there. I started looking around the walls and noticed that they had the more expensive items up there. Then I noticed a lot of All Saints pieces on the wall, which was funny because I had worked at All Saints in that time that we skipped, and I had a tons of items that were in perfect condition. They pretty much had only been worn in the store since we had to wear current season pieces as uniform. And by the time the season ended, you were so sick of those clothes that you never wanted to wear them again. So I left the store empty handed. I went home, I opened an eBay account and started listing my items. Because guess what? If they could sell those old dusty pieces for 80 bucks, I could get way more for the kind of pieces I had. And I had the good stuff, you guys. I had all of those beaded embroidered dresses when they came out, jackets, like all the leather jackets. I had some treasures. As I mentioned earlier, I worked in retail for many, many years. So I knew better than to just hang the pieces on a dimly lit bedroom door. I made sure all my pieces were steamed and I took the pictures against a crisp white wall. My items looked pretty good. And here's another one of those key lessons life was trying to teach me back then. Preparing me for the day, I started my own business. I used to dread floor sets and anything that had to do with merchandising. I hated having to steam everything, work overnight and have to take pictures to get approval from the higher ups to ensure that everything looked perfect. There was a rhyme and reason to why they did everything on the floor. What clothes were in front of the window, what pieces were in the very center of the store. Everything was carefully calculated by the merchandising team who was instructed by the analysts according to sales data. Sound familiar? Anyway, long ass story made longer by the fact that I talk a lot. I ended up selling all of my All Saints pieces for a great payout. And the best part was they'd been gifted to me as part of my uniform and my job as the press showroom manager. So this was all free money coming back to me. All I had to do was take pictures and list. I started to get really excited because my wheels started turning and I was like, wait, wait a minute. Maybe I could go back to that store, find some of their $80 All Saints items and flip them for $150. Now, to be honest, I didn't even think of the word flip back then, but that's what I was doing, right? Anyway, I went into Crossroads this time because I was in the area and they didn't have any All Saints on the walls, but they did have a beige tan leather bag on the back wall that looked expensive. How do I know this? Well, I went to fashion school. Again, I didn't finish because it was $21,000 a year back then, and I was not about to get myself in debt for that. But I didn't go far enough to take the textiles and construction classes. Another little nudge from life in this direction. I knew that soft leather like that, cut into so many panels, and then re-sewn to look like ruffles, was not only not an easy task, but it was definitely not cheap to make. So I asked to see it up close. The teenage girl behind the counter grabbed the bag and handed it to me without even a smile and walked away. I saw the paper tag on it. It said Burberry and the price was $42.50. But before I even opened the magnetic button, I knew this had to be mistagged. There was no way this was Burberry. I had studied Burberry during my retail years. 
There was no Nova check, which is their signature checkered pattern. No branding. I had never seen such an intricate construction pattern on a regular Burberry bag. Well, you guys, I was half right. It was Burberry, so I was wrong there, but it was actually the really expensive line, Burberry Porsum. Big difference. As in, not a $500 bag, but a $2,000 to $3,000 bag. I ran to the cashier and checked out. I was so nervous that they were going to discover my secret, but they didn't. The girl didn't give two shits about me or the bag. She checked me out and I ran for the hills. And I can't wait to tell you how much I sold that baby for. Resellers want to make more and work less? Kind of a stupid question, right? But let me continue. I can help you double your profit and income, pay off thousands in debt, and cut your time investment into reselling in half. But first, I need to show you what you're currently doing that is holding you back. Want to know about the top three mistakes you're currently making in your business that are costing you precious time and money? If you're ready to see the good, the bad, and the ugly that could be lurking in your reselling business, click the link below to take my free More Money Masterclass and pay attention. Let's just say there might be a little Easter egg in there for you. Okay, so back to the Burberry treasure I found at Crossroads for $42.50. I got home, cleaned her up, I put her against my white wall, photographed her, and listed her for $600. I hadn't become obsessed with market data yet, but I had all those years of designer experience, and I had been a retail buyer. I thought I shot for the stars on the price. I now know I probably underpriced, but that's okay. It was a solid payout for that one unit processed. You live, you learn. It sold a few days later for $485. I made about a 400 something profit on the one bag. And ladies and gentlemen, that was the day that I got hooked on reselling. After that, I would start going daily into the buy sell trade stores and just start buying all of the mid-tier and designer pieces I could find. It was much easier to find mid-tier than designer at that time. So I did a lot of Michael Kors, Revolve brands. I even dabbled in some Steve Madden. Not my thing. But my big break came one day when I found some Tory Burch flats. Now, if you've been following me for a while, you know that Tory Girl has a special place in my heart. Now, I personally never liked those damn shoes. I thought they were ugly, but I knew that they were super popular. All the girls had them, and they were like $200 a pop at Nordstrom's. Also, they had them in in every single color. Now, as a retail buyer, I knew that they wouldn't go this heavy on something unless it was flying off the shelves. I bought the two pairs of Riva flats for $25 each at a crossroads. They looked decent. They just needed a little shoe shine and they would look much better. So I took them home, gave them a little shine, and took some pictures of them, this time on my beige faux suede couch from Ikea. And I listed them. I don't think I can describe the feeling I got when my phone made that ka-ching sound and I saw what had sold. My Rivas, my dear sweet Rivas had sold for a hundred dollars. The other pair sold within a week for about 120. I was absolutely and completely shocked. Now I'm not gonna, I'm gonna probably talk about this some other day, but I went on to make over $15,000 profit from selling the same damn shoes over and over and over again. But that story is long and it's for another time, unless you're my student and you already know it. And if you're really curious, the entire story and strategy can be found in my business build out course. After this is when I really mastered the online sourcing game and was actually just getting presents delivered to my store daily. I was on fire. I made great money 
and it was all working out. Except I had promised Marco I would move with him to Europe for a bit since he had done that for me a few years earlier and it was part of our deal. Damn you, Europe. So when the time came, I sold off all my inventory. I closed up shop and I left to travel the world. And it was absolutely magical while we were traveling. But I started to face some really harsh realities when the dust settled. I had always been preoccupied with working and making money so that I could pay bills and my rent. I didn't really have time to think about life and what I wanted and what I liked to do because paying rent was kind of at the top of mind. But for the first time since I was 18 years old, I didn't have to worry about paying rent or bills. Initially, I thought that was an absolute dream. My prayers had been answered. I was gonna get super fit and learn to cook amazing chef style meals. And I was gonna reorganize the whole house container store style. I was gonna learn German and you know what? Even Italian and all sorts of other magical things with my new gift of free time. What I got instead was depression. I had no idea who I was or what I liked if I wasn't in survival mode. I had gotten used to the chase and now I was sitting still and it was hitting me all at once. This is something that is very common in people that have been through some challenging times. We get so used to living in survival stress mode that we kind of forget what it's like to actually choose what you want to do with your time. Owning your time and your freedom is such a foreign concept to a lot of us that it's actually scary. It scares us. I think a lot of people might self-sabotage owning their time because they're scared of the harsh realities that they would have to face if they had to just stop and think. I was one of those people. I was going down a deep, dark spiral. Everything I had shoved away in a corner in my mind for years was all of a sudden popping back up all the time. I had nothing to distract me from my demons. Now, Marco, being the wonderful and pragmatic person that he is, said, why, why are you sad in his German accent? You have always had to worry about paying for your life. Now you can just live. Why don't you take some classes or something that you've always wanted to learn? You've always said you wanted to learn to Photoshop. So start there. Take a class and see how you feel. You don't need to figure out who you are right this second. Just start with something. And I was like, okay, he's right. I always did want to be a graphic designer, but I had no money for school. So great. Baby steps. I enrolled in a Coursera graphic design class. I bought a cheap program that's the Photoshop com competitor, and I started learning to edit. Well, you guys, I loved it, and you can see it in my pictures now. I started getting really good about a month in, and by the third month, I was able to make graphics, logos, edit pictures, definitely not as strong as now, but it was good enough to start getting some ideas, get the wheels turning. And here's the other thing. I had thought about reselling many times while I was soul searching. How happy I was when I would find the treasures, the thrill of waiting to get the sale, and wondering what you could get away with on one flip. I really missed it, but it was impossible now. I was on the other side of the world, away from the stores, and there was just no way this would ever work, right? Well, that was a crock of shit. Because guess what? There is always a way. You just got to be a little creative. Remember that necklace story, the knot with the safety pins from episode one? Well, I was about to solve my own little self-created knot with my own version of the safety pin method. One night I was in bed and I couldn't sleep. And then I just got this crazy idea that I thought I could build an online store remotely. I had already learned how it all worked when I was reselling and I had learned to online source so I could do that from far away. I just needed someone to process and ship for me. I immediately thought of one of my friends who had just had her second baby and she was feeling like she needed something for herself that wasn't just being a mom all day. Not that that's a bad thing, but I get it. She had always worked before and she missed that part of it but she couldn't go back to a traditional job because this is America and childcare is wildly expensive. 
so it would have to be something at home. Also, she loves freaking fashion, so that didn't hurt. I called her the next morning and I was like, hey, I'm starting an online store. I'm going to buy all the stuff online, but I need someone to process, photograph, and ship. Will you do it with me? Now, she's one of my best friends. We were roomies. We've been through a lot of stuff. She knows my secrets. And she also knows that I can hustle and figure shit out. So that's all she heard from me. And she immediately said, I'm in. She also happened to have a huge extra storage room in her garage that they didn't use. So that was just another sign from the universe saying, let's go, bitch. I was set to go back to the U.S. in a month and she would officially start when I was there. The countdown on the Global Collective had begun. The day after her call, I developed some logos, a color scheme. I made a list of items that I thought I would start with. I sold $7,000 worth of stocks and I started buying crazy amounts of product online. Now this was really ballsy because my friend wasn't going to start until I flew there a month later. So for an entire month, I had stuff sent to my cousin's home in LA that she just kept locked for me in a closet. No checking if things were authentic or damaged or whatever. It was pure gambling. Luckily, only two of the items were damaged and they were cheaper ones, so I just moved on. So while I was away, I started contacting some of my rich friends and their moms and friends of friends, telling them that I had started a designer resale business and I wanted to help them sell off their unwanted items and charge them a commission. I immediately got my first three clients. The Global Collective Co. was in business. One was a good friend of mine. The other two were friends of my mom's. The consignment portion of the program was set. I mean, aside from the fact that it only existed in my head and I had to build it out before I got back in town. But we were good to go. So the result of this crazy dream and semi-wild plan of starting an online designer resale store remotely? Well, success. I made most of the money I invested back in the very first month of business. So it was basically profit from the second month on. Wild. I honestly couldn't believe how something that had seemed so incredibly ridiculous and impossible had been so easy to execute. The Global Collective was born. Now this is part one of the story. I started aggressively building from there. That first year, I took very little money out for myself. I didn't have that many bills and I had a decent amount of savings, so I only took out money for essentials and reinvested almost all of it. I would later experience the burnout that comes from working pretty much for free, so I started forcing to pay myself out a bigger chunk after reading the book Profit First, but I will get into that some other day. Students, you know how I roll with paying yourself. The point is, the Global Collective is the best thing that has ever happened to me. It is the culmination of all of those years of struggle and lessons learned. So many valuable lessons I learned in all of the jobs that led me here. I didn't always appreciate the life lessons, trust me. I used to wonder why I had to sit there and organize racks for hours. Why the late night floor sets? Why the intensity with customer service and sales techniques at Nordstrom's? Well, I know why. Because every single job I ever had, every struggle was a little piece of a puzzle. But it was a weird ass puzzle. None of the pieces would fit anywhere. They kind of seemed random. So I guess I just kept collecting lessons, puzzle pieces. And then the day I started the Global Collective, they all sort of came together. They all made sense. They all helped me build what the Global Collective is now, and they will continue to open locked doors and help me build something bigger. I know it. So I want you to go back through your entire life, all of it, even the really bad, challenging times. I'm not calling them blessings. Some of it really sucks, but I am calling them puzzle pieces and necessary lessons learned to go with them. Go back and write down the three most impactful things that have happened in your life. Three moments where you thought, wow, this really sucks. This is really shitty. There can't possibly be a reason why this would happen to me. Write them down on paper. 
and then examine them as your current self, as an outsider looking in, kind of like Lonely Boy. What puzzle pieces were you handed then that have helped you now? What hard lessons did you learn during those times that completely changed your life later? If you still have those moments, but no lessons attached to them yet, can you find a connection between the bad things that happened then and how they will help you build this business out? How they might help you in your current life? That concludes the first part of how I built the Global Collective Co. That got us into the actual store and designer reseller. Later on in the season, I will tell you about how I built my brand, how I positioned myself in this space, how I got into the service business and the digital product space. I really hope you enjoyed this episode and that you got something useful out of it. Please rate the podcast, leave me comments if you have any questions or insights, and make sure to save it to your favorite so that you're notified of new episodes. This podcast will be completely free, no subscriptions, no paywall. Everyone is welcome. The only thing I ask of you is, if you like the content, please share it. It will help me grow my little love project, reach a bigger audience, and hopefully help more people with the lessons I have learned. Thank you again for being here with me. I will talk to you all very, very soon.